Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I've got some pretty good competition tonight, I think. Um, <laughs> it probably says a great deal about the, uh, the, either the character or the perversity of the Houston Geological Society that they would find a talk on um, a failing global economy and oil prices more entertaining than what we're missing right now. Um, I will, however, promise far more substance. So, uh, <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll let you guys be the judge. But uh, so before I get started, uh, I, you know, my title is, is gloomy. Um, and I often get asked, you know, like, well, what motivates you to talk about this stuff? I mean, uh, why don't you tell us something good? And, and of course, you know, back to, to Tom's point about figuring out how to, how to make it as an unemployed geologist, or what was the title of that course, Tom? It was, uh, how to make it as an independent, that's right. That's started as self-employed. Self-employed, that's, okay. I, um, yeah, I mean, before you can do that, you gotta, you gotta see clearly what's out there, what, what's available, what, what the reality is. And, and most of, of what I read and the people tell me, and most of the questions I get asked, maybe I'm just the most perverse person in this room. In fact, I probably am. But I mean, it bears no, no relationship whatsoever to the reality that I see. So either this is the reality I see is just completely weird, or if you're approaching trying to get a job or be self-employed based on the information that is out there, um, good luck with that. So my goal here tonight is not to send everybody home depressed. Um, the, the message is clear. I, I don't see oil prices going anywhere good if higher is good, uh, probably for the rest of my career, which for most of you, you know, you, thankfully it won't be that much longer. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I, and, and if it does, I'll be the first one to, to get up and cheer. I mean, I'm not against it by any means. I, I, I make maps, I drill wells. Uh, I would like to see higher oil prices. I got no, you know, I got no motive here to keep them low. I, I just don't see any technical reason for it. So uh, before, I also, before I start, I want to credit my uh, collaborator on a lot of this, Matt Mishalik. Matt is a petroleum engineer in Sydney, Australia, and uh, maybe this is something I have in common with Donald Trump. I've never laid eyes on this guy, but we, we can work together thanks to the, the miracle of the, the virtual world that we live in. Um, so let's, let's uh, get started and see if I can do this. That worked great. All right, so <laughs> that's what you're missing. He, he chose this instead of that. Uh, so the way I see it, I, it just seems very unlikely to me that we're ever going to, at least in my career, uh, going to see sustained prices of $70 or more. I'm probably wrong as soon as I say that, but that's what I see today. And the reason for that, there are two simple ones, oversupply and falling demand growth. And those two things, for the last two and a half years, at least, every time that people think, okay, you know, now it's finally happening, happy days are here again, here we go, those two things conspire and they just keep pushing the vision of getting back to whatever normal is or was uh, into an ever receding future. And the reason, and then this is what I have in common with those guys tonight, except they're not going to talk about this, is that the global economy is shot. It's completely exhausted by four decades of funding growth with debt. And there's not a damn thing that anybody in this room or any president can do about that. I uh, wish them all the luck in the world and I, you know, all the good suggestions, but you can't, unless you can forgive $20 trillion of public debt and God knows how much private debt, you're stuck with it, okay? And, and as long as you're stuck with it, you can't grow because you spend all the money you got 
servicing your debt. I mean, it's just real basic. I, I'm not an economist, so I'm probably missing something here. But uh, so, so what we're seeing is we got this problem of too much oil and not enough demand, and yet we've got all these companies and producing countries that are in debt, and the only way to service the debt is to generate cash, even if it's at a loss. And so we're going to pump oil, we're going to drill for oil, so that we can get the cash flow to pay our debt, to keep the lights on, and etc. and we're losing money on every barrel. And it's going to keep on going until it can't keep on going, because that's what we do. That's what we do. E&P companies spend money. That's what, we, that's what the oil business is about. If you give me money, I will spend it. And there is a world out there that will give certain E&P companies money because of whatever, because they think they're going to get a yield off of it. What's going on, in the simplest sense, is we have seen one of the great, gigantic oil production and price bubbles. There have been two of them in my lifetime. And the one that we're done with right now is a monster. And like all bubbles, it blows up, it inflates until it can't anymore, and then it deflates. And we are in the deflationary stage of that. It burst in 2014. And so what happens when you deflate the bubble is because there's too much of the commodity and there's not enough demand for it, the price deflates. And we are in a serious price deflation. And so basically, put another way, oil was too expensive for people to afford, and now it's affordable. Okay, that's the good news. The bad news is, is that we can't stay in business at those affordable prices. U.S. light oil, and that's most of what we got in this country, and certainly all of the new oil that's been found in the last 15 or 20 years, whether it's tight oil, deep water, or whatever, it's at least 35, 40 degree API gravity oil, okay? It's got nowhere to go. We don't have the refinery capacity for it. And the world doesn't have the refinery capacity for it. And yet we keep producing it to keep the lights on and pay the bills. And that's why we've got this monstrous overhang of inventory. And until we get through that inventory, there's no technical possibility of getting back to happy days of 70 or $80 oil. Once we work through 125 million barrels of excess capacity and storage, we can start talking about that again. Well, that's just the, the beginning of it, as it turns out. And so in, in trying to unravel this, this story, Matt and I have come across uh, this item that the EIA reports every week called Unaccounted for Oil. And it's a fascinating deal, and I'll tell you about it, but it's, it's all the oil that we don't know about that is needed to balance the equation balance all the inputs and the outputs and come up with the amount of oil that they think is in storage. Well, so if, if, we, if, if what I described in the first five minutes sounded ugly and messy, now we've got a real mess because we've got a statistical nightmare that I don't know how to resolve. Well, and this is where our buddy Donald and you know some other folks come in, that in the midst of all of this, We've got a global uprising going on. And that's, that, that's what's happening in this country. That's what has happened in the United Kingdom and uh, their exit from the European Union. That's what's happening in Greece. That's what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, the world, the people of the world have had it. They don't know why, but they know something is terribly, terribly wrong. And they're sick and tired of it, and they want to kick out all the elites and all the people who they think got them into it. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, that's understandable. Um, the issues, of course, seem to be mostly about immigration and borders and, and those kind of things. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that at the root of it, it's really about hard times in a failing global economy. It's about the fact that I have to work
work harder today than I did 15, 20, 25 years ago, and it's harder for me to make ends meet than it was then, and you know, both of us or all three of us are working. People, the public is not dumb. They're able to say things are worse than they were before, and all you guys keep telling me, politicians, economists, you know, oil men, I don't know, that, that you know how to make it better, and guess what? It's worse. And so you're at it. And that, that's basically what, what's going on. I, that's what I think is at the root of it. And why is that? And why do we care? Because as I've said many times, and I'll say it until you run screaming out of here and say, where is Hillary and, and Donald, because they're more interesting, it's because energy is the economy. It's not a separate topic. It's not, you know, it's not, well, let's talk about football. Or, oh, let's talk about, you know, what, what, you know, what, what I saw in church today. Or, what, you know, it, it, it runs through the whole thing. I mean, people think that, that the economy runs on money, but it doesn't. It runs on energy. Money is a call on energy. I need you to do something for me. Dig a hole. Figure out a computer program. I'm going to pay you money for your calories. That's what money is. It's a proxy for work. Okay, so where does our where does our work come from in today's economy? 60% of it comes from oil. 86% of it comes from oil, natural gas, and coal. 3% of it comes from renewables, and then there's hydro, and there's nuclear, and all of that. So. So that's, that, that is the economy, and that's why you can't talk about why the economy's failing unless you talk about what's happened to the cost and availability of energy. But you will never hear, that won't be mentioned tonight. I promise you. It will not be mentioned tonight. Nor will you hear it ever mentioned by Larry Summers or Paul Krugman or any of the esteemed economists that seem to run the show in this country. Because it's not part of their equation. Now, I, you know, why? I don't know. It seems pretty obvious to me, but then again, I'm, I'm just not an economist. So, debt and the cost of energy underlie that failure. All right, so here, here you go. Here, here, here are the two big bubbles. Um, you know, most of the people, a lot of the people in this room are as old as I am. So, uh, you know, we, we, we lived through this one, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. You know, I didn't lose my job, so that was pretty good. Uh, I knew something had happened, and the price of oil went down a lot. But it was a big bubble. Okay, so you got oil prices at $20 forever, more or less. And then all of a sudden, boom, one, one month, price doubled. Okay, and that's the famous Arab oil embargo, which actually had nothing to do with the embargo or the war that it was supposedly about. It had to do with the biggest currency devaluation in the 20th century, which was when Richard Nixon decided we were no longer going to be on the gold standard. And everybody else who was a part of the Bretton Woods Agreement said, us too, we're out of here. And so the value of all the world's currencies went in half, and therefore the price of oil doubled. We can blame it on OPEC all we want, and they probably had a little bit to do with it, but you know, that was step one, and then step two, of course, was the Iran-Iraq war and a bunch of other junk like that. And, and okay, so uh, that was a huge bubble, and what all that did, price of oil went up, we spend like crazy, drilling everything in sight. And we get to a point where we produce so much, and it got so expensive that we got an oversupply we don't know what to do with. It got so expensive that we destroyed demand. And whoosh, the bubble deflates. Prices go to hell. Stay there forever until we do it again. And that's what we've done. And the one that we're in right now, this thing going on right here, started out because we were running out of oil. It was a war. Not running out of oil, but we, we couldn't increase production. By the time we had to discover a new field, bring it online, an old field would deplete. Population kept growing, demand kept increasing, and then China borrowed its way 
into the biggest fiasco in the history of the late 20th and early 21st century that we all call a miracle, the miracle of Chinese growth. Okay, 300% of GDP is debt today in China. Okay, that's that's going nowhere. Now, if you if you fund your GDP with debt, it looks pretty good until it doesn't anymore. I told you this a year ago, and it's such a great thing. I'll tell you again. China manufactured and consumed more concrete between 2010 and 2013 than the United States did in the 20th century. And if you think that was all based on good economics, let's talk about it afterwards. That's called government subsidy on both ends. You give them money to make the stuff, and you give them money to use the stuff, and they built cities that no one lives in, they built bridges that have glass bottoms so you can go out there and look at nothing. I mean, you know, this is, this is serious business. But they created all that demand. So, but right now, no, there, there's no play in the world for a company of any size that is coming anywhere close to breaking even. And I'll argue with you all night and show you the data as to why, but they're all lying when they tell you they are. They're telling you about their best wells. They're not including all the costs. God knows where they get the EURs from, but you know, I'll sit down with them and go head to head. That's, that's, that's really where the big mistake is. It's, it's they, they've overestimated EURs. But bottom line is, None of that stuff, even if you believe it's breaking even, I mean, find me an investor in the world that's happy to break even. I'll fire my financial advisor if he tells me I can give him all this money and he won't lose any of it. Terrific. Well, that, that, that's what they're telling you is great. So by my estimation, oil prices are getting you about 75% of replacement costs on the better plays that are out there, certainly in our country, if not the world. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the play the oil plays in this country on a competitive basis with the rest of the world. OPEC has figured out how to load up their stuff with debt and overhead and all that kind of crap too. And if you read what I've written, I mean, actually the Permian Basin, I call it the best of a bad lot. I mean, they beat the pants off of everybody in OPEC except Kuwait on a, on a you know, return on investment. That's how bad we've gotten. Technology. Okay, oh well, let's talk about this. So, so I said prices are going to be low. Now, my title after forever had a question mark, and I want to emphasize that question mark and maybe put an exclamation because forever is really a long time. But um, there's going to come a time in a couple of years. I don't know how many. It could be two years. It could be five years when all the underinvestment that we're doing, not doing, whatever. We're not spending money on, on development. Proven reserves sitting out there. That all we have to do is say, OK, go, and, and make those proven reserves into supply, much less exploration. That's going to come back and bite us in the ass big time. And the world is that this is going to end when we actually start having a, a food fight over physical supplies. We're, gonna, we're not going to, at some point, we're not going to have enough. And the price is going to go through the ceiling. And we're going to be back in the $120, $140 oil again. And that will last six months, 12 months, 18 months, I don't know, until it totally craters the entire global economy. Because that's what we will do. So we will see high oil prices again. And nobody in this room in the right mind wants that. Because that will tank the whole thing. And maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need a good economic collapse, and that, then the debt will go away, and we can start over, and we'll probably screw it up that time, too. Um, technology. Promise you somebody's going to ask me, well, what about, what about, what if, and maybe, and, you know, fusion, and uh, I had a guy once ask me about, well, what, what, if, what if we could drill a well with a laser? <coughs> well, yeah, what if we could? I mean, go get Jed Conner. You know, you can shoot the ground and you can get it out that way. But, but you know, okay. Let, let, I, I'm a big technology freak. I mean, I use a lot of technology. I'm, I'm all for it. But we are an old extractive industry. And if you believe this crap, you know, about the oil coming out, you just keep it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, have a really good life. Because, it's, it's, you know, I drill wells, and I promise you that when we're drilling a well right now, we're probably going to make it a million dollars under budget, and the well we drilled before was probably twice the budget. And, and there's nothing 
what happens? Stuff happens. You know, it's operational. Weird stuff happens. I mean, you, you don't know. So renewable energy, you know, I, I'm all for it. But look, technology can get the cost down. You're never going to go back to the price of oil when you were finding big ass fields. When you were finding East Texas or Bovar or much smaller fields. Good old conventional oil. You're just never going to get back there. You can just wipe it out of your, off your list. And renewable energy is the same way. It's great. And we're going to need it. But renewable energy is not going to get us back to the big surplus of energy we had in the middle of the 20th century that fueled this tremendous expansion and growth that everybody thinks we can just get right back to if we just elect the wrong person or the right person. I've shown a version of this slide before. I'll show it again because it just seems so darn obvious to me. This is a uh, five-year moving average of US GDP and oil price. And what you can see very clearly is that when oil prices get high, economic growth is flat. When oil prices are low, the economy grows. Okay? It's, it's real simple. Um, and, and if you ever needed a simple example of why energy is the economy, there it is. And why is that so? Well, because, and this is, by the way, normalized uh, 2016 dollars, because it's so, because when energy costs are low, the cost of doing business is low. We move stuff all over the world. We transport, we manufacture, we use electricity, we use boats, we use trucks, we use all this stuff, and it all costs money. And if the energy that we use to run all that stuff is low, then we have a chance of making a profit. And if it's super high, then we got less chance of making a profit. Underlying costs come from somewhere. The global economy expanded in the 1980s and 90s because oil prices averaged $34 a barrel in 2016 dollars. Okay, we think oil prices are low right now. Yikes. You know, we're at 47, 46, 47 dollars today in the same dollars. You know, that's 20, 25 percent higher than they were for two decades. Then oil prices doubled from 34 to 68 between 1998 and 2008. That's when China was borrowing its way to prosperity. And then from 2008 on, uh, they subsequently went up to almost $90 a barrel. And so today, at today's real oil prices, we're two and a half times what we were two decades ago. Can't make it go away. It's not an interpretation. That's just the way it is. Therefore, it's hard to make money. But politicians and most people just don't see this as a problem. It's not even part of the conversation. Most people believe that continuous economic growth is, is a natural law. Or, or it's a divine, it's divine providence or something. But that's the way things always have been and always should be. And if it's not working that way, then it's some politician's fault. It's a management problem. You know, we got too much of this, or too much of that, or we're, you know, too much welfare, or we got bringing in too many Mexicans. I mean, I don't know what it is. All that stuff is tinkering around the edges. Maybe it's important, maybe it's not, but this is the problem in my world. So America's golden age, and we're talking about that tonight. I promise you that, making America great again. And I'm here to tell you that the U.S. golden age of economic growth and prosperity following World War II was a singular phenomenon. That means it happened once, and it probably could only have happened once, and it probably will never happen again. Why? Well, because we produced 52% of the crude oil in the world in 1950. And we didn't need anybody else's stinking oil. We had everything we wanted here, and we exported it around the world. One of the main reasons the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor was he cut them off from oil. They didn't have any oil. They were pissed. So they bombed us. We controlled the price of oil. It was cheap, 20 bucks a barrel. Texas Railroad Commission, along with some of their cronies in Louisiana and Oklahoma, they set the price of oil for the world. 
And it doesn't get any better than that. You produce half, and you control the global price. Fantastic. And we have a positive balance of payments. U.S. oil production peaked right here in 1970. And by the way, every time, every time I get deposed, first thing they, 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 I'm a weirdo because I'm a director of the Association of the, for the Study of Peak Oil. And this is, you know, it's a theory, right? No, it's an observation. Once things peak, they, they go downhill. That's all it says. And when that happens, there's a problem. And so, you know, people argue, oh, well, you know, we, we, oil hasn't peaked yet. Well, guess what? It didn't peak because right here, we increased our imports by five times in seven years. Yeah, that keeps you in oil. And you send all that money somewhere else. So you got money in oil, it isn't your own, and you're paying through the nose for it. That's what happened to you. The oil shocks of the 1970s and 80s made energy prices high. We rebuilt Japan, we rebuilt Germany. They started competing with us, and it was over. Energy prices got high, and we weren't, but we had no competition. How's that for a competitive advantage? Everybody else in the world is in ruins, and we're fine. We got the only army, the only navy, the only functional economy. Pretty good, I mean, that, that should make it into the Harvard Business Review. That's, uh, figure out how to do that again. Real oil prices quadrupled, right here, right here, and world consumption fell 10 million barrels a day. That's a deflation. OPEC cut 14 million barrels a day, and they couldn't bring prices back. It's like Humpty Dumpty. They couldn't put them back together, and that's when they gave up. Prices did not recover to $40 for almost 20 years, till 2004. That's how long it took to work through that one. Now, I said a long time, I don't think, I don't think we're there. I don't think we're, we're that bad. I, if that makes you feel good, then leave now. Because that, that's as good as it's going to get. <laughs> the second coming. OK, Ronald Reagan was undoubtedly God. And I, I, I remember Ronald Reagan. I didn't vote for him either time. I thought he was a really crummy president. But, but you know, try to tell that to anybody. Because compared to all the crap we've had since, he was great. He really, you know, he really was. But, but the truth is, is that the second coming of Ronald Reagan was better living through debt. Ronald Reagan inherited a situation that he couldn't have planned, and that was called cheap oil prices at the end of that big boom and bubble deflation. And then he inherited a guy named Paul Volcker, who Jimmy Carter had appointed head of the Federal Reserve Bank. And Paul Volcker decided that the way to fix inflation, which was a problem, was to raise interest rates to 16%, which he did. And there it is. So there was interest rates under Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and boom, here comes Reagan, 16%. What does that do to US Treasury bonds? Well, it makes it absolutely the best investment in the world. 16% return? Man, alive. I mean, I'd rather have that than the Permian Basin. I mean, you know, wrap the whole thing up and with a bow, and I'll take a, a, a T-bow that's going to pay me 16%. Okay? So what happened? The Treasury bond became the effective reserve asset of the world. Every piece of Dollar, pounds, euros didn't exist, shekels, dinars, they all came pouring into the United States. And guess what we did with all that money? We, we said, great, we'll take it, we'll put our growth on a credit card that we're never ever going to pay off. And guess what? You got a problem. If, you, if, you're, if we owe you money, you got a big problem. And all those guys do have a big problem. And what they do? They did the same thing, so now we all got a big problem. So the oil bubble burst right about the time Volcker did all that, and so we had two things going. All the money in the world could have started an oil company in the middle. It would be great, right? And, and energy prices were now back to 20, 30 bucks a barrel. Perfect. In fact, they were $34 for the next 20 years. Well, 
this was pretty good. And, and so what happened here was, um, starting with Reagan, we started borrowing all this money. Got a trillion bucks by the end of, of Reagan. By the end of Clinton, we got six trillion bucks. By the end of Little Bush, we got 10 trillion bucks. And right now, we got probably 20, 18, 20. That's what funds growth. Okay, GDP is a great thing you can, you can do with that, just as well as you can with sensible business. Then our, our buddy Bill said, well, let's get rid of this thing in Glass-Steagall Act, and let's let banks have some fun, and let them play the casino gambling game too. And what happened under, under Clinton was everybody in the whole damn country needs to own their own home. Because we're kind of done with public debt when we weren't, but they thought we were. So let's get into private debt. And you guys can all get a second mortgage, a third mortgage, a fourth mortgage, and you can buy that Chevy pickup, you can buy that flat screen, to you can buy whatever you want, because it's free. And so this graph shows public and consumer, but that, so that, that, you know, you run out of public debt, you, you, you go, f and, and then you go financialize the world, and you tell the banks, they can take all that personal debt, and they can package it up into these really cool things that nobody understands, you know, these securitized mortgages, and you can sell it around the world, and you can leverage it, and then people can buy swaps on all that kind of stuff, and pretty soon, I mean, what they're doing over there in Kashada, it ain't nothing. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so with China getting involved, flat production, return of high oil prices, too much debt, we cratered the whole damn thing in 2008. Well, after the financial collapse, this is interest rates. Um, in our wisdom, we decided the only thing that we could possibly do was bring interest rates to zero. And um, OPEC cut some production, and oil prices didn't, they, they, they went back to where they were going pretty fast, and that was great. And when we got zero interest rates, that means that I can have free money. Because you can't make any money in a bank. You can't make any money in a treasury bond anymore because it pays a percent and a half or something like that. So if you've got an oil company and you tell me that you're going to sell me your stock or you can borrow money or you know, let me buy a share offering or you know, a junk bond that will give you a yield, we'll pour the money into that, reinflated the bubble and since OPEC helped with a price cut, um, we had high prices and free money for about seven or eight years. And what happened? Well, we went berserko here in North America. This is not petroleum products. This is oil, crude oil, at least condensate. Canada and the United States increased their production of crude oil and least condensate by five million barrels a day. Okay, that's a lot. That's a whole lot. In fact, it was so much that it created an oversupply and collapsed the bubble in 2014. So that's the history lesson. That's where we got here from. Okay? And most people don't want to hear that because it's painful. It's painful to understand that you can't undo any of that stuff. So where are we today? Well, we're out here. Right there. Okay? There have been, here's the collapse. This is about beginning of 2015, right here. There have been four oil price cycles since the collapse, and for whatever it's worth, they, oh, the first three they each lasted about six months. And what I'm showing here then is oil price, and I think that's WTI, you know, it's NYMEX futures, it's WTI, and then this is an oil price volatility index. And so, in case anybody needed to know, oil prices have been real volatile here for the last two years, up and down, up and down, like crazy. And so what happens is that every cycle begins with high price volatility, so you get, you know, price volatility is up while prices are down, boom, here goes prices, and then volatility goes to nothing, the prices go down. So this is a real nice little inverse correlation, and you can find this, by the way, this is the, the oil version of the VIX, this is the OVX, uh, you get it online free and, uh, and do what you like with it. I'm not an investment advisor, but it's not a bad...
correlation. So we're, we're currently out here in what I'm calling cycle number four, and cycle number four is going nowhere. We're stalled, you know, kind of bouncing around between 43 and 46 dollars a barrel, and that's because prices have nowhere to go. So if we look at all this, and here's the same cycles, and here I'm just showing uh, currency exchange rates. Uh, that's a pretty nice negative correlation too, and we can talk later about why that works. But um, the important thing to gather from all this, just empirically, there's $40, there's $51. Those are kind of range boundaries. Here I just took the NYMEX and did a 200-day moving average, and lo and behold, you get 38 and 52. Th those are, you know, for whatever it's worth, those are the range boundaries. So prices started to go up in this cycle. Uh, interest rates fell when everybody figured out that Janet, you know, and her guys are going to do moon dance forever. And they're not going to raise interest rates. They don't raise interest rates. Value of the dollar goes down. The price of oil goes up a little bit. Now they're not going to do anything until December. We'll see about that. And, and these price things, you know, every once in a while people say, oh shoot, we're not spending any money, we're going to have a problem down the road, and so you have all this stuff on. Basically, it's all noise, okay? There's no, real, there's no real fundamentals going on here. It's just news, and you know, maybe OPEC's going to freeze production for whatever the hell that accomplishes. They're producing flat out, so I guess that's really good. Um, people get interested, price goes up a little, the price goes down a little bit. But the, the bottom line and the part that's important is the upper boundary is really controlled by record-breaking volumes of world inventories. And we forget about it and all of a sudden, oh shit, yeah, we got a half a billion barrels of oil sloshing around in Cushing and the Gulf Coast and you know, and the OECD's got three billion barrels sloshing around. And yeah, it's kind of hard to have a price rally when you got too much oil. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Bummer. Um, so th th this is, this is our, our, our inventory. That's, that's an arrow. That's not a, a, a precipitous drop. But, so there, there's 2016. 2015 was a whopper, and we're way above that. And then these are the preceding four years. So, you know, that, that, that's a problem. Uh, we had an interesting development here just in the last, I guess, three weeks. Um, inventories dropped 20 million barrels. Uh, it didn't do very much for price because people have kind of gotten, you know, gotten hit to this situation. But um, basically what that was was, uh, was Hurricane Hermine, Hermine. Those are net imports, and you see there's a whole bunch of tankers still circling out there in the Atlantic waiting to offload their, their oil and you know it helped a little bit but even even with all of that you know what we were looking at was building inventory during what's normally destocking season that's real bad we have this huge correction and we're still 54 million barrels above last year's inventory and 120 some odd above the five-year average so that ain't going anywhere. Um, there's just no basis for a sustainable rally, no matter you know, how much we wish it were so. Can't happen with all that oil up there. There's just no way. And so I'm telling you that until we draw down that inventory by like 125 million barrels, which isn't going to happen, we could have per mines from now until you know Christmas and the next year, and we're still not going to draw down 125 million barrels. Prices are going to stay kind of where they are. At least they're not getting to 80. So, Matt Michalik proposed to me that we take a look at inventories, which I just showed you about. And while we were looking at inventories, um, we came across something that we both kind of knew about, but hadn't really thought about very much. And that is this problem that light oil, tight oil, has got absolutely no place to go. That if we look at, this is the average refinery input in the United States. There's the average for the U.S., and this is just divided by regions. The average oil input is 31 gravity oil. Okay? This is a graph showing U.S. production by API gravity. Here is 31 right here, this little 
hunk of crap. Um, there's 40 to 45. And so 70% of U.S. domestic production is greater than what we use in our refineries. And 50% is greater than 40 API gravity. So 4 million barrels a day is the super, super light stuff that we don't have hardly any refinery capacity for. So what do you do about that? Well, <coughs> you'd like to find out what is our refinery capacity for light oil, except you can't, because nobody knows. The EIA can't tell you. And so you can find some funny little sources like the American Fuel Properties Management Group that did a study of 61% of their refinery buddies. And, and they came up with a range, a, an upper range of about two and a half to maybe three and a half million barrels a day that could be expanded if it was all used by 2016. Problem is, is that as of June of this year, we're producing four million barrels a day. So, you know, just do a simple subtraction, dumbass subtraction, and that's five million barrels a week that we can't refine. So, 700,000 barrels a day, got nowhere to go. Ah, so what we're going to do is we're going to export it. That's a really good idea. So, you know, Murkowski and all these genius politicians that say they know about oil, uh, because they, well, they come from the same state as Sarah Palin, they can see oil in Russia. <laughs> so they want to know something. They got, they got oil in Alaska, don't they? That's right. Um, and, and so we, we really need to repeal this uh, oil export ban, which was put there for a stupid reason. The stupid reason was that imports went up by five-fold in seven years after oil peaked. And that was viewed by some dinosaur politicians as something that we probably want to avoid if we can help it. So don't send it out of the country. I'm not saying they were right. I'm just saying that's what they were thinking. Well, you can see how effective that was. Here's total U.S. exports. Higher before the export ban was repealed than when it was repealed. And it's just kind of been flat ever since. So um, big failure. I mean, it's a Y2K kind of thing. You know, we get all excited about it, and then it's over. And you know, is there somebody to sue here? I mean, I, I don't know. Who was responsible for Y2K? I mean, we spent billions and billions of dollars. And you know, I woke up on New Year's Eve in 2000, and I mean, what? And, and, and there wasn't even an investigation. It's weird. It's, uh, it's a funny world we live in. But anyway. So we export our asses off. 90% of our exports are greater than 40 API gravity. And the reason that we can't do anything about it is because nobody wants it. Guess what? The world is geared for 31 gravity oil just like we are. And oh, by the way, most of the oil that we exported before and after goes to Canada. How exciting is that? And uh, the rest of it goes now to funky places in the Caribbean. You know, there's a teapot refinery in Curaçao or Aruba or, you know, big time kind of productions of there. Peru's got one. And, and so, you know, we can kind of dribble out a couple of thousand barrels here and there, these little ass refineries. And oh, guess what? Right now they're refining Bonnie Light. And so we can take a deep discount to kick Bonnie Light out and make no money by sending it over there. But, we're, but we did it, okay, and that, that's really good. Because we're not in business to make money. So not only do we send most of our oil to Canada, but we import most of our oil from Canada. In fact, we import 3 million barrels of oil a day from Canada, much more than all the Gulf Coast states put together. And the reason this works is they got heavy oil, and we got light oil. We send them light oil. They blend it with their heavy oil. They send their heavy oil to us to refine because they don't have any refineries. They got a few up by Montreal and Quebec. But Canada is even weirder than the United States in that they don't connect the two halves of their country. So they have to import oil from, from OPEC to supply the big population centers. And they send all their oil to Chicago and Cushing and go figure. But that's, you know, that, that, that's what it is. So, the end of the day, exports are a disaster. Well, 
The weird thing, if you're looking at inventories as we are, <clears throat> is you know, you'd like to be getting rid of oil, but that's oil imports in 2016. And so first conclusion is, oh, well, we're producing less, and so we're just making up for it. But no, it gets back to gravity. Okay? The United States is in the business of exporting refined products. That's one of our big businesses. There is the growth in refined products. We got to have the imported oil, the blend with the light oil, to make the diesel, to make the jet fuel, to make the gasoline, and all the stuff that we make a lot of money on by sending it overseas. But we're back in the same box. You just, you know, you can only use the light oil so much, and then you have to import somebody else's heavier oil to blend with it to make it all work and make some money off the deal. Okay. So now this is the really. This is the bizarre part and mystery that maybe somebody in this room is smarter than Matt and I seem to be. But the next step we said was, okay. So the EIA nicely provides this thing called Petroleum Supply Weekly, in which they tell you everything you need to know. Just like Enron told you everything you need to know. And when they cratered, the whole world said, she's had that now. And so we said, okay, we're smart. We're going to figure all this out. And so we figured, well, gee, you know, how hard is this? There's uh, the inputs to crude oil supply are production and imports. Okay, fair enough. The outputs are exports, which I've told you don't amount to diddly squat, and refinery intakes. Okay, what comes out of Cushing and everywhere else and goes into a refinery and comes out as you know, jet fuel or diesel or whatever, okay? Easy enough to do. So we can be really smart guys, and since EIA provides us all this, we'll add this plus this and subtract that from them and that from them, and we ought to be able to figure out on a weekly basis how much surplus or deficit we have, and that ought to be the amount that goes into or comes out of storage. Made sense to us, except it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And in fact, this then, the red, are weeks of negative supply balance, and blue are weeks of positive supply balance. You can see it's all over the damn place. I mean, week by week, it's, it's crazy. And we, and we didn't make this up. I mean, believe me, we didn't make it up. And so what we did was we came back here to, I don't remember, 2002, and we just said, okay, let's take crude oil inventories as reported by the EIA, and let's just start adding and subtracting all this stuff every week, and we get something we call the implied inventory, and guess what? It's real different from what gets reported every week. In fact, it's 400 million barrels different as of right now. How's that for a surprise and a mystery? Okay. High or low? Low. So we are told we have 550 million barrels of crude oil in U.S. inventories. And in fact, we have about 125 million barrels according to this equation. Now, 400 million barrels of oil difference. Well, there's another thing that you can find in the Petroleum Supply Weekly, and it's called unaccounted for oil. And that's the adjustment factor that's used to sort of get you balanced. And, and you know, I would really like to be able to tell an IRS auditor when he comes and looks at my company's books that, yeah, I've got this unaccounted for money category that I use every week to make everything work. And you know, you, you, you get that, right? I mean, that, doesn't everybody do this? Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way blaming EIA, okay? I think EIA, I mean, where, where would you be without EIA? Well, I would never talk to you about it, okay? I could make stuff up. I could be like the guys talking in Long Island, making stuff up. But that, that, that's, the, that, that's the truth. So what, what could be happening? Well, we could be underestimating production. I don't think so. 
because that gets reported by the states, and they report it for only one reason, they want the tax revenue. So if anything, you would think they would overstate. Imports, the same deal, okay? It comes into the country, somebody's got to pay a tax on it, okay? Uh, exports, they don't matter. And so the only possibility, I mean, this is like Sherlock Holmes, right? You know, when you've eliminated the impossible, the, the only logical solution is the improbable. And the improbable is that we don't have a good handle on what actually goes in and comes out of a refinery. And, and that's what we learned, is that harder than hell to find out what their capacities are and what kind of gravity oil they can process. I, I'm not, you know, so I don't know what it all means, except we got a big mess, is what we got. So whatever all that means, um, what we did here then is we said, all right, let's take the moving average of all that supply, let's forget about inventory, let's forget about unaccounted for oil, we'll just see what it looks like when we take a 12-month average and plot it next to WTI. So we got WTI in orange and oil supply balance in blue and man alive, I mean that's about as good a correlation as you ever want to find, at least in my world, that, that's, that's awfully good. And so the only difference between these two graphs is this one is plus and minus and this is incremental. And so if we start right here at the end of 2011, which is kind of when tight oil really got going in terms of production, and we take that as a baseline, we can say, well, the additional oil that basically we couldn't process or export was 400,000 barrels a day as of February 2016. And guess what? correlates perfectly to the lowest oil price known to man in the 21st century, $28 a barrel. Perfect. Exact same day. Interesting. So now we've got Hurricane Hermine and maybe some other things, and we've come down. We've come down 100 million barrels, 100,000 barrels a day. Okay, so is that good? Well, I, I guess. Um, that says that... Uh, Somewhat positive, but it still is, you know, we still got, I mean, 300,000 barrels a day times seven. That's two million barrels a week that were stacking up in tank farms and underground storage. But we don't have anything to do with it, apparently. So we got a long way to go before we get to a balance. So almost done. Um, the crude oil supply balance is a nice thing, but then we got the real world, and this is the real world. And so here we got NYMEX price, oil volatility, and here what I'm showing are the rig counts of the Eagle Ford in gray, the Bakken in red, and the Permian in blue. And in case anybody needs to a lesson in Sesame Street, and which one of those is different. I'll get my three-year-old grandson here to help us out. And the Permian is different. And so what's going on basically is the following, and that is that whenever volatility gets high and price gets low, people think that, oh boy, there's going to be a big price recovery. Capital flows to the, from the credit markets. And that's what rig count measures, by the way. It doesn't have anything to do with anything except Where's the money? It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a capital flow measurement. That's how I use it. I would suggest that's how other people use it, but I, people don't do what I do, so that's fine. Um, what it tells you is, is that 65% of the capital going into the oil business in the United States is going to one that's going to money. And what that's about, as I wrote about a few weeks ago, is it's called a race to the bottom. And the investment markets have figured out most of these companies are toast. And so we've now narrowed the field to the guys that we think are going to be the winners and the survivors, and they'll get our money whenever they want. And so what you desperately want to do is to be in that crowd. And if you're Pioneer or Concho or Diamondback or Parsley, you know they're all companies with Parsley, I don't know. Um, but anytime they want to go to the capital markets, you can get a billion dollars. In fact, Parsley and Diamondback put out a share offering a couple of weeks ago 
They got $1.5 billion in four hours. Awesome. Somebody was here asking me working to get 40% for his Louisiana <laughs> well. That's where you go. So this is what happened. So despite past history, investors believe that this time it will be different. And why? Because they're all geniuses. They are. They're the first person to ever figure out that buying low and selling high is a smart idea. They and they do it every time. Every cycle they do it. Okay? But it's really not about that. It's a stock game. It's, it's, it's casino gambling. But the, uh, I, I will go, I just discredited inventories, but, but I, I will show you a little bit about inventories. And this is uh, Gulf Coast plus Cushing. It could be anything. This is what my friend Mike Bodell calls a yield curve. Comparative inventory, what we got today versus the moving average of the last five years versus price. And you can pretty much, so here, you know, here we were at $100 in 2014. We slid down that yield curve all the way out to here. We had a little rally here in early 2015. And now we're going around in a circle, we're going around in a circle. $51 and $38, and again, these are the same numbers, and I didn't superimpose them on the date. And so what happens is, is that the price goes down, refiners buy more oil, inventories go down, price goes up, price goes up, inventories buy less, refiners buy less oil, inventories go up, Price goes down, inventories buy more, refiners buy more, inventories go down, price goes up. And this is what Albert Einstein called uh, insanity, okay? It's, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. So this is, this is what I call Einstein's quadrilateral of insanity. And, and it can go in either direction. We're right there right now, by the way. Uh, with higher oil prices. So, but the reality is all this money is moving around because the stock prices of Diamondback and Parsley and Concho and Pioneer, they follow WTI. And you know, you, you can go up 20% in a month. And if you're, you know, if you watch it like a hawk, just like you need to, you know, when you get the Baccarat table, you can make a lot of money or you can lose your ass. And then that's, you know, you can read my blogs to find out which companies to invest in. So, final slide, I just said that thinking this time is different is the definition of insanity. This collapse is different, so I'm insane. Um, but it is. It's, this collapse is different than 1982, 1986, and it's different than 2008, 2009. And the reason it's different is because I think Debt has pushed the economy beyond any reasonable limit. We just didn't have that level of debt as a world, as a country, in 1982. We had a whole lot more of it in 2008 as a world and as a country, and we fixed that debt problem by more debt. That's what we did, and that's, that's what's been giving us the illusion that we're getting better. Oil producers, in case anyone in this room needs me to remind you, are on life support. Um, and yet, if you read what the companies say about themselves, and you read what's written in the Wall Street Journal and all the industry rags, except for my website, of course, um, you will hear the most outlandish claims in the whole world about what these companies and the analysts that are sycophantish to them, because there's money in it for them, say, because they're making a fortune. We're killing Saudi Arabia. I mean, you know, we our, our lifting costs in the Permian Basin are a fraction of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. But everybody's losing money, so, you know, who cares? It, it really, you know, I mean, like, we used to have this argument on the playground in fourth grade. You know, my dad's bigger than your dad. Yeah, but they're both little guys. <laughs> Drive little cars. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I just think that all the talk, I mean, it's what, it's what we do, okay? It's noise. It's absolute noise. And that's 90% of what I get asked about is noise. Well, don't you think that, you know, that the, that the, because the rig count is down to a fraction of what it was and yet we're still producing all this oil, isn't that a miracle? Well, God of mercy, I guess it is. But how many producing wells are we, are we putting online every month? 
Just as many as we were before. I don't care about rigs. Rigs don't produce oil. Wells produce oil. Is it a miracle that fewer rigs can drill more wells? I guess it is. What does it cost? You know exactly what each one of those wells costs? Add them up. Add them up and then tell me if it's a miracle. How many billions of dollars a month are you spending to keep hope alive? That, that, that's, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. That's just the reality. But the problem is, is that you, you, you spread all this, this crap out there and people believe you because they don't know any better. The public believes you because they want to. And politicians believe you because they might get reelected if they believe you. And, and so everybody thinks that tight oil is a great success. And again, you know, compared to Venezuela, compared to Ecuador, compared to most of OPEC, it is successful. There's nothing wrong with it if you like to be the best of a bad lot. Renewable advocates, oh my god, I mean, you know, I love you to death. But it's 3% of primary energy consumption today, and I don't care how great it is, you're not going to get from 3% to 25% or 30% in the rest of my lifetime. It's just not going to happen. I mean, that's just the way people are. I mean, I, I, you know, I just got off an airplane that was 40 years old. And it got me here just fine, by the way. And the reason that they use that 40-year-old airplane is because it works just fine. Is there technology that's better than 40-year-old 727s? Of course there is. But that doesn't mean you're going to throw everything away. So because you know, the price of solar panels is way down, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's all because the Chinese economy is 300% you know, of GDP, they're dead. But okay, you know, um, take it. But the point I want to make, and this is the key, is that if you can figure out how we can all live the same way we are right now on renewable energy, I promise you the earth is hosed. Oh, it's just as bad as it is if we use fossil fuels. You're depleting the planet big time to support our way of living, which doesn't make it bad. It's the way it is. And what we all want is a solution that allows us not to change and to have everything work. And in that. It defies the second law of thermodynamics and just about every other law of physics that I know. But that's what we all want, and that's why people, that's why when I get to code, well, you're weird because you think that oil is not infinite. Well, wait a minute, I didn't say that. I say it's, it's as infinite as you want to pay for it, but it gets expensive. But no. Um, so we never find this, this, this discussion, um, but the public gets it. They don't know what they get, but the public knows that there's something terribly, terribly wrong. And that's why we've got Brexit, and that's why we've got Arab Spring, and that's why we've got ISIS, and that's why we've got Trump, and that's why we've got Cruz, and we've got all these guys. Because people are pissed. And there's a global upheaval because they want to restore the impossible. They want things to be the way they were once and will never be again. I know that's, that's really a downer thing to say, but I mean, that's just the way I see it. And if somebody can convince me otherwise, I'll be the first to sign up. My view, and I'll leave you with this, the best path forward is to stop looking for improbable solutions that allow us to keep on living in this stupid way this wasteful way, light energy is cheap. It's not. Wake up. It's expensive. Adjust. Learn to live with less and be happy. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, I'm out of here. I, 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 want, to, I want to open the floor for a few minutes of questions. Can you take... Uh, Two or three questions, if there, are, sure. uh, if there are any. If anybody's still alive. Martin. Martin. Natural gas. Uh, natural gas is coming on like the change from whale oil to kerosene. Uh, the question is, does that change any of this? Because natural gas is now so available and so cheap. Uh, 
um, that it looks like it will replace oil, and I do. The oil will never roar again because it's being replaced by natural gas. What do you think? First of all, um, as I wrote in April, the price of gas is going to double when it has. It's three dollars now. Okay. And um, again, we get lulled into our own mythology of abundance. That's the story we were told. Remember, we have at least a hundred years of natural gas. Even President Obama knows that because I don't know, but he knows that. He, he said it. State of the Union address a while ago. But if anybody's bothered to check, and you can read my post on that, all shale gas plays are in decline. Most of them in terminal decline. The Barnett's dead. Nobody's drilled a horizontal well in Barnett all year. The Fayetteville's dead. The last horizontal well drilled in Fayetteville was in the middle of January. Haynesville. People are still drilling out there. Don't ask me why. The production is half of what it was at one time. These were, these were plays that were going to last 100 years. Okay, they didn't last 10. They work just like every other oil and gas discovery on the planet. They go up and they go down. So there's, nothing, there's nothing unusual. I mean, they're, not, they're not bad because of that. That's what happens to all oil and gas fields. They're following the laws of physics. That's what they're doing. Okay, but somehow these are supposed to be, you know, these are supposed to be a miracle. Okay? Even the Marcellus is down half of BC half of the day. The Utica, for crying out loud, is brand new, it's down. Why? Okay, is it price? Sure, some of it's price. But a lot of these plays, it's just it. That's it. And, and of course we know that conventional gas has been in terminal decline for 15 years. Nobody's drilling any other well. I mean, guys like we're drilling wells, but nobody that matters, no volume that matters is being drilled. And, and so if, if the price of gas got to four dollars, and I think it will without any problem in the next year or so, uh, I'm not a price predictor, but I just look at fundamentals and I've been right so far without being a price predictor, then you're going to say, but they're going to get back to drilling like crazy. And maybe they will if they can find the money. But you know, those guys are not in the club. Okay? They're, they're not in the Permian Basin. They're out. Now, some of them are still sort of in, but uh, they're more out than in. And um, if you could have all the money in the world, how long does it take to reverse that kind of decline? Well, it's, it's a long, slow process. So, so that's, that's part of the answer to your question. But the more important part of your, and it's the same deal as with, with, with renewables, okay? The technology has existed for a long time to run your car on natural gas. Does anybody in this room drive a natural gas powered car? No, of course not. Now maybe some of the you know, UPS or you know, fleets and that kind of thing, perhaps. But none of us do it. Why? Legislation. No, it just doesn't make economic sense. It's going to cost you 12,000 bucks to convert your car to natural gas. You lose your trunk space, and you get 40 miles or 50 miles, and then you're toast. Okay? And gasoline doesn't cost very much right now, particularly. So, you know, so what are you going to do? So, human beings are very slow to change. Now, uh, yeah, the, uh, and, and, and you're absolutely right, and that, that, that's great. But uh, my view of that is, hey, you're going to make that happen. You're going to make it happen by forcing people to, to do what they don't want to do. 